Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Miriam Schulman. Miriam is an artist and founder of The Inspiration Place, where she helps other artists learn how to profit from their passion. Through her online classes, business coaching programs, and podcast, Miriam has helped thousands of artists develop their skill sets and create more time and freedom to do what they love. Miriam's artwork has been featured on NBC's Parenthood and the Amazon series Hunters with Al Pacino. Her forthcoming book on how to make it as an artist is scheduled to be released in 2023 by HarperCollins Leadership. Miriam, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Josh. So great to talk to a fellow artist. I actually wanted to be an artist. I went to a year of art school and then I switched over into business. So I kind of took the opposite career track of you. You started out in business, right? Well, I always wanted to be an artist, but you know, my, I was raised by a Jewish mother who was like, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a disappointment. And uh, being, being that I actually came from a single parent household, I didn't feel that I had the luxury to um, just to not make it. And I had, as many people do, I had the fear of not being able to make a living which is why I did take the practical route. And I, I did study art in college, just wasn't my full, I, was, I didn't go to art school and I didn't go all in with that until much later, which is I think we're talking about today. Yeah, I got it. So you're a closet artist all along though. So Always. So you went to Dartmouth, you went to MIT, you ended up working for a hedge fund, is that right? That's right. And it's a pretty famous hedge fund that I worked for. There's been several books about it. So um, yeah, I've been, it's been quite the, quite the ride. And so tell us about the career change that happened uh, during or after 9-11, after those attacks. Well, Josh, it really began, or my disappointment or disillusion or however you want to tell the story, it, it, and by the way, this is chapter two of the book. So uh, it really began in 93 because I was working during the bombing of the World Trade Center in 93. And when during that time, we were not told that it was a, a terrorist attack. We thought it was a Con Ed failure. And... I happened to be in the cafeteria when the power went out and my friend and I, we marched up 37 flights of stairs to return to our desks where we saw everybody in our office who did know what was going on working. And outside the window, we could see the North Tower. We could see the smoke coming out of it. So this was not 9-11. This was 93, the first terrorist attack. So flash forward or move forward to when 9-11 happened, I, it was like PTSD. I just had this flashback of when I was working in the trade center and being in that culture of you work, even if there's a terrorist attack going on next door. And I had, I was not actually working at that time. I was taking what I thought was going to be a temporary maternity leave, a temporary break. But I knew that I couldn't go back because I knew that that culture would have killed me. That I, if I had been working during 9-11, I would have been one of those people in the second tower who didn't evacuate. It's just by the grace of God that I was not there at that time, that I was not part of that world, and it could have been me so easily. So that was my wake-up call, that I was not going to return to that world. Uh, so you just said, forget it. I'm out of here. And how, how was that? I mean, did you have a plan? Did you have an exit plan or was it just, I'm done with this? I'll figure it out. Well, I, I actually had exited a year prior. So my hedge fund, it was a pretty famous hedge fund, blew up and it blew up, blew up the financial world in, in 98. And uh, I was part of that, that world as well. That, so that was a, a pretty cut cataclysmic event that uh, we, our hedge fund lost billions of dollars and I was kept on for some time there, but every day I was going into work and kind of pretending to work because my job really, what I was doing had been eliminated. Like my functionality at the firm had been eliminated. 
And it was so obvious to me how little meaning I had, how my life lacked meaning and it lacked purpose. And so I did exit actually a year prior to 9-11. That was the temporary maternity leave I thought I was taking that, okay, well, I could come back if I figure it out. And it's like that hero's journey where you take that step forward and then maybe the hero is going to want to come back. But that event happens where you cross the threshold and you know you can't go back. So 9-11 really was the crossing of the threshold moment for me where, okay, I know I can't go back now. This is not going to be my story anymore. Got it. So then how did this transition into taking art as the thing that you were going to focus on? Josh, it's a great question. And people wish I could, I wish I could tell my story like 9-11 happened and then I became an artist. And I actually, that is the short version of the story, but there were some steps in between. So I started painting on the side. I wasn't convinced yet that that would be my full-time living. And I started teaching Pilates for a gym and they wanted me to sell personal training packages and they were giving me all kinds of training on how to make sales. So it was then I was like, oh, wait a minute, I can use exactly what they're teaching me here to sell Pilates packages, to sell my portraits, to sell my commissions, to sell my art. And that's when things took off. So that was kind of the other aha moment. Like I was given this magical sword, like, okay, here's how you make sales. Got it. And so then it worked out evidently. Tell us a little bit more about that. How, how you made it work? How did it work out? Were there some challenges along the way? Yeah, I was too stupid or naive to think it was going to be challenging. Like, so I, I, I just kept doing it. And if things didn't work, I tweaked and kept figuring things out. Um, so I, I did very well selling portraits and doing commissions, um, selling my art online, and then eventually online classes. And after some time, people started asking me to show them how I did it. And that's how my coaching practice then started to take off and flourish as well. So it wasn't all the rainbows and daisies the whole time. I definitely earned my stripes learning along the way, as we all do when we're, when we're building anything. And don't you agree? When you're building anything, there's going to be some, some challenges. For sure. So fast forward to today, the inspiration place. What does that empire look like? You've got a podcast. You've got the book coming out. You've got clients. Tell us a little bit more about what it looks like today. So I have um, my online class site is the inspiration place and my podcast is also the inspiration place and it's how I teach other artists. So the inspiration place first, first and foremost, it was to teach people my art technique. So how to paint, how to paint portraits, how to do the watercolors that I was doing. And now that's also where I teach people how to make a business out of their art. And how long has it been that you're teaching people how to make a business out of their art? When did you fully transition into that being the focus? Yeah, I'm, it's not um, my, my, the full focus. So I still am fairly evenly balanced between, I do have an art practice and I do teach people how to, to paint with those online art classes. I would say it's by, by now though, the coaching practice is about a third to a half of my revenue. It comes from coaching. And that started around two years ago. I had people who were coming to me first for one-on-one -on -one help. And then I saw that people were all coming with the same sorts of problems that it didn't make sense to me for everyone to get one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is why I built a group program. Got it. And tell us, how did your art end up in Parenthood and Hunters? I mean, how'd you get your art on TV? That's pretty awesome. Oh, thank you. So basically people who are doing set designs, they are on the lookout on the internet for types of art for so for parenthood i think there was a character who had asperger's who was obsessed with bugs and i had a mosquito painting that they just thought was perfect for it of course i watched an entire season before i spotted my painting like I guess a good show. I don't know if I would have watched the whole season if I wasn't looking for my painting. And uh, for Amazon, the hunter, something similar. They wanted some Judaica for for one of the set designs, and I happened to have a painting that fit that for them. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. So let's get to the book then. So what was the inspiration for the book to say I've got to write this book? I've got to put some of my material in a book. 
Oh, that's a really great question. So people have been asking me, um, you know, they've been asking me for years, you know, do you have a book on this? Can I find your book in stores? You know, I had the little ebook lead magnets. And so people were like, well, do you have an actual book on this? And it's something that I think so many people, Josh, and, and you probably have this statistic at your fingertips more than I, but I heard the other day, it's something like Americans, it's something crazy, like 70 or 80 or 90% feel they have a book inside of them. Do you know that that's... Yeah, I don't know what it's the actual something, okay. statistic is. I think it's probably making, closer to like 97% or something, but it's, yeah, everybody feels like they could write a book, right? Right. So... I have a story inside of me and I made it a goal. Well, last year I made it the goal, a goal to write the book and I didn't finish the book last year. And I decided that was a terrible goal. So this year I changed the goal and 2021, I decided my goal was to get a publishing contract. And that was a much better goal for me. So what so was I your first step on that? Because that's tough work too. That's maybe harder than writing the book. Uh, yeah. So the, the first, the first step for that, of course, is to get a proposal together. So, and, and there was a lot of drama around writing the proposal, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I knew that if I were to go that route, then I only had to get what I was working on good enough to get me to the next st st step. So the proposal only had to be good enough to get me an agent. And then the proposal only had to be good enough to get a publisher and now it's like i'm still with the same mind frame everything just has to be good enough so i can go to the next step where i'm going to get help along the way so that was my attitude towards getting getting the agent and ultimately the contract to write the book okay so how did you write the proposal because most people out there first-time authors they don't even know what a book proposal is or that you have to write one or that you have to write it to get the agent so how did you educate yourself about writing this book proposal and get it done yeah i i think part of it is because i am surrounding myself with people who are doing similar things it create it which does a few things for me one it creates the the possibility in my mind you know when you surround yourself with people who it's like the jim Rohn quote you you become the average of who you spend the most time with but first and foremost is making that possibility real in my mind you see other people doing it who i feel are just like me so therefore this possibility becomes real but then also being part of those conversations so where they're saying oh i took this class or uh, somebody had just said, well, the proposal, the, the agent helps you with the proposal. It only has to be good enough for that. And they will help you rewrite it. So that helped too. And I took a course, which I'm not going to name the course because I don't feel that helped me as much writing it, but you know, I threw money at the problem. And eventually I just had to get somebody to sit on me every Monday. Let's write the book proposal. <laughs> that, that's ultimately how I, I did get it done. Helps to have that accountability. Oh, yes. So then how did you go about pitching agents or how did you get connected with the agent you eventually chose? Okay, great question. So inside this Facebook group back in 2020, um, there were two women discussing their book proposal process and someone says, oh, I'll introduce you to uh, my agent. And of course I go into publisher's marketplace. I said, who's her agent? And I write that down. And then the friend got her book deal like two months later. So it's like, okay, who's that agent? Same one, wrote it down. And that became my first choice for my agent. And that is actually the agent I got. Now, that makes it sound like very charmed life, but that, that truly was what I thought, okay, she's my number one choice. But I went to my bookshelf, I pulled out all the books I liked to, to read, and I said, looked in the acknowledgments and made a list of agents that way. So those, that was my first round of who I was gonna pitch for the book. And after that, I had nothing. So um, I did get the yes for my first choice. I did get a lot of no's um, for other people. Got it, so you weren't just depending on getting that one agent, you had a backup plan that you were already executing there. 
had no idea I was going to be that age. And she was one of my top choices. I wouldn't say she was my only one, but I did feel like this was the right person for me because she helped people who I considered like me, you know, not not the Elizabeth Gilberts of the world, but people who who have some sort of online business and an influence and a presence. So I figured I was modeling myself after what their success path looked like. And there were a few others, you know, some of the people, those few others said no. Um, if I hadn't gotten that yes from M Michelle when I did, I got a lot of no's. And my next yes um, happened many months later. I, I didn't withdraw the submission because I assumed that these people were, you know, there's that thing they say on their website, if you don't hear from us in a month, we're not interested. So a couple months later, I got this other person who said, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to represent you. I was like, okay, too late. But if I didn't get that first yes, I was getting a lot of rejections and I wouldn't have known, let's pretend I didn't submit to Michelle. Like if I didn't, if I wasn't in this Facebook group, I might've just gotten all those no's for months and months before I heard a yes. That could have been the story also. That's true. That's interesting. And it sounds like you narrowed down the scope of who you were pitching, or at least with Michelle, your agent that you went with, you knew, you had some reason to believe that she might be a fit for you. Whereas a lot of people out there, they say, well, I'm going to go get a literary agent. And then they just send their proposal to anybody and everybody without thinking like, is this the type of agent or is this the agent that represents the type of book that I want to pitch or that I want to write because not every agent works with every type of author, right? Yeah. Yeah. And th yeah, there was, and there was, and the other things that were happening too, there were other agents that said, I like what you're doing, but I already represent somebody very similar to you. So that could have been the story as well. Just so what, the, if someone's listening to what I'm saying, find somebody who represents people like you, it's still got to be like you, but different. <laughs> Right. And the point being, just because an agent re rejects your book doesn't mean it's not a good book. It could be all sorts of different reasons, right? That's true. Although um, I feel that I also, the book proposal evolved in that rejection process. Um, a lot of people say, hey, it's not a fit and they don't give you a reason. And you can tell, And you can tell when they're giving you just a boilerplate canned, their canned Gmail response or whatever it is. But there was one agent who took the time to actually let me know why she was passing. And that was some of the most valuable advice I got that I was able to incorporate into one of my revisions, which made the proposal successful. Can you tell us what that was, what that feedback was that was so helpful? Yeah. So um, Michelle, who did ultimately represent me, she didn't actually give me a yes at first. She said, I'm interested, but... So that I'm interested, but could have turned into a no. And she gave me some specific advice. And then this other agent said to me, you know, I like your idea, but you saved the prescriptive content for the end or something like that of that nature. I was, you know, I wish you hadn't saved it all for the end. And it, it echoed Michelle's advice, but it resonated in a different way with me. Like Michelle was also saying, be more prescriptive, but the second agent saying you saved it for the end, somehow it clicked what my, what I needed to really change to make the proposal work. So I had taken Michelle's initial feedback, this other agent's feedback, and that's what I incorporated into my proposal that I resubmitted to Michelle. Gotcha. And then, so Michelle then took it on and then began the whole process of pitching for publishers. Can you tell us about that process? Yeah, so she was very clear. She was more clear than I was what kind of book this was because um, I do a lot of mindset with my artists. I wasn't sure if this was a, a, a book that was going to go to... Um, I'm thinking of the publishers, but now I'm blanking out. There's certain publishers that work a lot with art books and creativity books. Uh, so I wasn't sure if that was the route. I wasn't sure if this was more like a, a self-help type of book because there's so much mindset in there. And Michelle was very clear that this was a business book. She was very clear about that vision. So she made her list of top 
choices where she wanted to pitch me. And we got um, a lot of early interest from from HarperCollins, who ultimately um, bought the book. And when you say this is a business book, it's still an art book. I assume it fits in with the inspiration place and what you do. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's in the book and the content and how it's arranged? Yeah, well, it's a book on how to make a business out of your creativity. And so is it limited to visual arts or is it broader than that? It is broader than that. Um, that was also part of the challenge when selling the proposal was really showing to both the agent, because the agent had this question as well, the agent and the publisher, what the market was. And I did a lot of research to show what's the size of the Etsy market, which by the way, grew enormously during the pandemic. As you can guess why. Like so that worked in your favor. <laughs> totally. So that was number one. But the other thing I was looking at, I was really thinking outside the box, how can I show them how large this market is? Because my market isn't just people who are professional artists who are in galleries and museums and that that really isn't my ideal reader. My ideal reader is the dreamer is the woman who's shopping at Michael's, who's thinking about quitting her job and turning her creativity into something that is more sustainable. So I looked at, look at what the size of that market is. Look at the size of the hobby market. Look at how, like the billions of dollars people spend at Michael's every year. That's the market. So that market research that I handed to the publisher on a silver platter, that really helped sell the book. Gotcha. Interesting. Now, did you have any competition in this space? Are there other people who have written similar books that you had to explain why yours was different or was it a wide open ocean of opportunity? Oh, no, of course. So, you know, that's always the challenge for authors to, and, and that's what I did need help with, like looking what the comps were. So, uh, Lisa Congdon is an artist in my space who has written books on, on, business books about art but it's looking at and then the other ones who have like jeff goins um real artists don't starve would be a similar book and something else and something else so there's a few things there i have to show how my voice is different how my point of view is different and how my message is different so it's all those things and how did you do that? How did you get that across to the publisher that, hey, I'm different, here's how I'm different? Can you give us some s specifics about that? Well, sure. I mean, uh, like b both of those authors I, 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 I named, Jeff Goins and Lisa Condon, neither one of them is a mother with children. And that's a huge part of my audience are, are, are women who have children who are being given the message that you can't be an artist and a mother. So I felt that that was a big dis distinguisher between my message and the message of other authors. It's just like a, a different positioning. There were also other books where the, the, the mindset and the why was there, but it didn't really then go into the how to. So exactly like what that agent who I, who I didn't work with said to me, oh, you, did, you saved the prescriptive material for the end. When I was looking at comps, one place, Josh, that I spent a lot of time was looking at the negative Amazon reviews because that really gave me clues into how what I was going to say was going to be different, which didn't mean I was going to bash the other authors because, I mean, if Michelle was pitching me to their publisher, that would be a huge turnoff, but really helped me create the language and describe, well, I this book over here gives the inspiration, but my book really gives the how to, how to do it. That is a great takeaway right there. If people get nothing else from this episode, just that idea of reading the negative reviews to find the holes or the opportunities, that's a great tip right there. Oh, wow, I didn't know nobody knew how to do that. <laughs> like, I, I thought that was obvious to me. Like, okay, just see what people bad are saying about this book, and then you'll figure it out, what you need to do differently. Well, I love reading the negative reviews. Those are the fun reviews to read because people are actually saying what they think. You know, it's not that interesting to read. Oh, this is a great book. This is so good. It's so helpful. But man, when people tear something apart, you're like, wow, this is really interesting stuff here. Yeah, I also read uh, negative podcast reviews. That's one of my... 
like <laughs> instead of Netflix. Like, okay, what do they have to say? Even Brene Brown has negative reviews. Yep, yep. Everybody's got them. So tell us how that pitch act ended up being secured. I mean, Harper Harper Collins took it. What was that process like? Was it an immediate, hey, we want this, here's an offer? Or like, what did that process look like of going through and finalizing a deal? Yeah, it was actually, we want this. So um, the first the first message I got was from my, my agent who said, oh, I just, sent, I just sent off the first batch and I already heard back from HarperCollins, they want to set up a meeting. And uh, so again, it sounds like there was so, when you describe it that way, it sounds like, oh, and this happened and this happened, it was so magical. I think it's the same thing with the agent. We just happened to be in alignment because M Michelle, my agent, was my only yes. Well, there was one months later, but we won't count that for now. And <laughs> this was also my only yes. It wasn't like five people said, we want to set up meetings. She said that she wanted to set up a meeting. So they set up a meeting, and on the meet during the meeting, um, the editor says, well, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but we're making an offer. So That's kind of uh, nice to hear, right? Yeah, it was. And then... Uh, I didn't know what to do. My agent was so worried I was going to screw things up. I said, well, should I send a thank you note? She's like, no, we <laughs> don't want them to think we're that interested. It's like, okay. Uh huh. So what were some of the other things that your agent did to navigate that process and make sure that that deal came to fruition? She did all the negotiating for me. So she gave me feedback. The only thing that did happen was we did have an initial offer. Um, and when she told me the number, I was like, oh, they definitely will go 10,000 higher, ask for more. So that was the only input that I really gave her on that. Um, but I, she may have come to that conclusion on her own. I can't, don't know if I can take credit for that. But she took care of all of it. So that's great. So then now it, we're recording this in 2021. The book is scheduled to come out in 2023. What happens in, no? Nope. I, I did give that information to you because that's what I was told uh -huh. on my, my initial, what's it called? Deal memo. Uh-huh. Okay. I know all the lingo for like two months you learn it. Okay. So no, it's actually coming out in 2022. Okay. 2022. Do you have a month for that? Yeah. October. October. Okay. So a little over a year, it's going to come out. So you're working on writing the book at this moment, right? Can you tell us where you're at in that stage in the process? Yeah, this is the messy middle for sure. So, um, this is the messy middle. So I've gotten two chapters done in addition to the ones I submitted for the sample chapters. So I guess that puts me a quarter of the way through, but I am enjoying the process more than the proposal writing process. That's the good news. But there's definitely more drama coming up for me. Yeah. Tell us about that. What are some of the challenges you're facing? Well, anytime that we're beginners, and I, I think, Josh, this is more true. There's, there's again, there, I'm going to quote a study that I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think this is true, more true for women than it is for men, that the imposter syndrome kicks in, like, oh, wait, they're going to they're gonna discover I don't really know what I'm doing. I'll have to give the money back. So the only thing I found that's worked for me, Josh, is that I have on my calendar seven to nine and it's ass in the chair, ass in the chair from seven to nine, Monday through Friday. And the willingness, and this is something that Eric Mizell, uh, who is a creativity coach taught me. He, he's not my coach, but he's been a guest on my podcast, uh, that not only do I have to be willing to write a first book, I have just my joke, but giving the punchline. Not only do I have to be willing to write the first draft, but I have to be willing to write the first book. And I keep coming back to that advice that not, I forgot to ask you, is this is explicit where it's okay on your podcast? You can you say gonna, whatever you want. I can't guarantee it will all make it in, but you can you say gonna, whatever you want. You're going to bleep it all out. <laughs> so bleep, bleep. Okay. So 
this is my first book and I have to allow that this book is my first book and it's you know like even even Brene Brown's The Gifts of Imperfection it's a good book but Braving the Wilderness is so much better so I don't have to start off with my first book at somebody else's ending I'm at my beginning yeah, I love that because there is that feeling when you're a first time author, like, oh, if I if I mess this up, that's it. I can never write another book again. But, right? but then I meet people who have written 30 books and I think, well, wait a second, like what's to stop me from practicing on the first five books and then say number six is really the big one. Because some of these people, they write 20 books and then it's number 21 that really takes them into celebrity status. Quick break here. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to write a book that will help you grow your business? Visit PublishedAuthor.com, where we have programs to fit every budget, programs that will help you write and publish your book in as little as 90 days, starting at just $39 per month. Or if you're too busy to write your book, we'll interview you and then write and publish your book for you. Don't let the valuable knowledge and experience you have go to waste. Head on over to PublishedAuthor.com to get the help you need to become a published author. You've already waited long enough. Do it today. Now, back to the show. So with your book, the process that you said you have this routine, seven to nine every morning, you're in the chair, you're writing. What about the process, outlining, structuring the book? How did you work through that? How did you think about that? Like, what's your process for getting through the book and mapping it out? Well, that's what the book proposal does. So I have a book proposal and... We had the kickoff meeting with the agent and actually what surprised me is I thought like I was going to get a little more help from the editor along the way. And they're like, come back to us in December when you're done. <laughs> like what? What? No one's going to supervise me. Uh, so each chapter, what I do is I go back to the book proposal and I look at what my chapter summary was. So th the chapter summary I see that as that's the promise of what that chapter is going to be about. And I just look at, am I fulfilling the promise? What I promised Topper Collins I would write for chapter two, am I fulfilling that promise? So the title of that chapter can change. To me, that's fine, as long as I'm, I'm fulfilling the promise of, of what I said the chapter would be. Gotcha. And have you been restructuring anything along the way? Have you been getting into it and saying, oh, I know I put this in the book proposal, but now I want to change everything. Have you faced any of that or are you pretty solid sticking to what was in the proposal? I think I'm too early in the process to say that there's going to be extensive renovation, but I have changed, like I said, I have changed the titles of the first two chapters already. And some of the content has changed because as you know, it took so long. I mean, it sounds, I know it sounds like it happened fast, but I secured my agent in March and by Easter, we sent out the proposal. So from Easter to now, that's a lot of time, especially during the pandemic. And some of my ideas have changed. So there's ideas, not that I've done 180 on anything, just like I've had new ideas, ide concepts that I've introduced on my podcast that I'm like, this is such a great concept. I'm putting this in chapter one. This is such a great concept. I'm putting this in chapter two. So the promise stays the same, but the some of the examples, some of the, the thought leadership work that I'm doing in the books has evolved since I've written the proposal, but having read the proposal, you wouldn't know what I had in mind for that chapter versus what I'm putting in now, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Now you mentioned your podcast. Tell us a little bit more. How has the podcast helped you with the book? I mean, you just mentioned an example or two there, but I think this is a great point that hosting this podcast myself I'm already getting feedback from people saying, you've got to turn all these interviews into a book. There's so much great content here. And I'm like, I know this would be great to share all this in book form. Does that happen to you a lot with your podcast where you're interviewing a guest and you think, ooh, this story they're telling or this thing they're mentioning, I've got to put that in my book. That's a great quote or that's a great story. 
Yeah, what I've been doing um, since since I've been on this book journey is testing material, kind of like a comedian does, like testing material out on the podcast and seeing if it resonates with my audience. In 2020, when I first set off to, oh, I'm going to write a book this year, I thought all I had to do was take 14 of my episodes and transcribe them, and that's my book. That's not my book. <laughs> that's like basically scratching the surface. So there's so much. Uh, they, I feel it, when I'm writing, putting together this book, it's more like... Um, doing a puzzle where I'm pulling a piece that may have appeared in one podcast, an interview that got shared in a different episode, a, a book or a movie that I read, a, a book I read or a movie I watched that may be, get pulled in from my experience. So I'm pulling in like disparate elements and it's kind of like, here's the eggs, here's the flour, now I'm making a loaf of bread. Here's the eggs, here's the flour, but now it's a cake. So it's pulling in different pieces and doing that alchemy to turn it into something completely different. And Josh, if you've ever tried to do this, if you ever tried to take in any of your episodes and put it into written form, the medium is so different. It really isn't, it, it, you're really starting from scratch. Like the ideas are there in the podcast, but the structure and the format is so different. It's like poetry versus a song versus the odyssey mm -hmm. yeah they're very different i love that idea though of testing material out kind of like a comedian there is a lot to that so with the with the book structure you mentioned before we started recording you talked about how part of your story was going into chapter two how much of yourself and your story and your experiences are you putting in this book some people are afraid to share that type of stuff so that's why i'm curious to know all right, that's such a great question. And that was a lot of the advice I had gotten early on. So when I was struggling with my proposal last year, both the book and towards the end of the fall, I started working on a proposal, is it really resembled more a cringy memoir than it did a how to sell your art book. And that was shaped from getting feedback from agents like i shared before they want more prescriptive material that i use so now my story in most chapters they are just examples and antidotes to create a point the only chapter that feels truly like my story is going to be chapter two and i purposely put that as the second chapter not the first because this is not a book about me. This is a book about my reader. And I want my reader to see themselves in my story, but it, this book is not about me, it's for them. They are the hero of the story. I am the guide in the story. I am not the hero of the story. Well put. So backing up a little bit, you decided you wanted to go get a book deal, have an agent, have a publisher, did you ever seriously consider self-publishing the book? And if so, why did you decide against that in favor of traditional publishing? That's a great question. So when I made my goal 2021 to get a book publishing contract, I thought, okay, I'm gonna give myself a certain amount of time to secure an agent and get a book deal. Should that fall through, I'm, I'm writing a book no matter what, but it didn't. Um, my incentives for going this way is I really wanted the collaboration. I really believe that my book will be a better book because of this collaboration. Had I just read, written a book in 2020 on my own, it would have been transcriptions of 14 podcast episodes. I, I mean, this really what the book has now become has evolved a lot or or like i said before the cringy the cringy memoir so now this is not a book about me it's it's not a book that just serves me and my ego this is a book that's in service to other people gotcha so you mentioned speaking of the collaboration you mentioned that you're getting a little bit less collaboration from the editor than you were expecting or you're wanting are there any other surprises that have come up during this 
process where you thought it was going to be a certain way, but then it turned out that it's different? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so yeah, my kickoff meeting, I thought that that was going to be where we we're going to go over the outline and they'll tell me, you know, like this is, we like this chapter, not that one. So I actually had postponed starting writing my book until that first kickoff meeting. I, I was like the very belligerent teenage boy, you know, I, I, not to pick on boys. I have, I have, I have a son who was like this. So it was like my son, let's just put it that way, not without generalizing. You know, my son who say, I can't, I can't start the assignment because I don't know what the teacher wants. But really, they're just procrastinating. So yeah, that's what was very surprising to me where they're like, no, no, just do what's in the book proposal. That's why we bought it. This is what we want. And that kickoff meeting was actually their marketing plan, which felt to me like, why are we even talking about this now? I haven't written the book yet. So th I found that a bit surprising. The other piece that I thought was, I thought it was going to be this, but it actually was that. I had thought I would have to get a book launch manager, which I'm still not completely sure what that is. I just know people who've come on my podcast have had one. Maybe you can tell me what, what, that, what they do. But and so I, asked, I asked the editor with my agent there if I need that. They said, no, but you do need to get a publicist. So they do want me to get a publicist that will complement whatever it is that they're doing. So I'm in the process now, Josh, of interviewing publicists to help me. And I probably won't wait until next year to start working with one because I do believe that amplifying my brand and my audience now more than what I can do on my own is going to help the ultimate success of this book. And speaking of the marketing plan, did HarperCollins say what they would do in terms of marketing, or was it more about what they wanted you to do in terms of marketing? Yeah, no, they told me what they're going to do. I don't know what the budget is that they didn't share with me, but they did talk. We did talk about that. There's going to be money for Facebook advertising and for Amazon advertising, which they find highly effective. So that was good to hear because Amazon advertising is, is not something as an author with a traditionally published book that I would have any control over. So I would need to depend on them to do that. Yeah. And that's great that they're actually putting budget towards that because that's one of the sticking points a lot of people have with traditional publishers is that they come in and say, all right, book's done, go do your marketing. And people say, wait, I thought you did that. And the trip publisher says, no, we're leaving you to do that. So it's great that they're putting some money behind your book to push it out there. Yeah. I don't, again, I don't know what that is that, that I don't know. I should probably see if I can find out, but I don't know that that if, even if they shared the number, it would be meaningful to me having not run any of Amazon advertising myself. Well, it sounds like they really believe in your book and believe it has some good potential given that they're putting some marketing budget behind it. So that, yeah. that sounds great for you. So with the, I know you're early in the process, but for our audience of first time authors or people who are just aspiring to be first time authors, what are some of the main points that you would want to communicate to these listeners to say, Hey, I've been there. I know where you are. And here are some key points of advice. Yeah, Josh, so this is something I share with my artists and something that I'm sharing in the book. It, it, artists who are at that threshold and they want to make a full-time living of their creativity, whether their art is writing as your audience is or creating visual art or music or any of those things, you're always going to have that fear of something going wrong and not making it. Our brains have evolved to be wary of fear. They, our brains want to keep us safe. They want us in that cave. And our fear-based brains are going to come up with all kinds of reasons why something isn't going to work. I don't call these excuses. I call them doubts. So all the reasons. And the smarter you are, which I'm sure your audience is very smart intellectuals. The smarter you are, the better you are at coming up with these reasons and they don't feel like excuses. They feel real to you. 
They feel real. So just to be careful of what you're, the stories you're telling yourself, those stories that you're making up in your mind, why it's not a good time to start, why you're not ready yet, why something won't work for you. Be careful of the stories you're telling yourself and rewrite those stories. It is your time. You'll never feel ready. It's your time and you're gonna do it anyway. And you're ready for this step. Uh, is a perfect place to wrap things up. Miriam, this has been such a great conversation. What's the best place for people to find you and connect with you? Well, I would love for them to come and listen to the podcast, of course. It's the inspiration place, and it's not just for painters. It's for creatives. We talk a lot about mindset. So if you've enjoyed what I've been talking about today, you're, you're certainly going to find something you're going to like on the podcast. Perfect. And do you have a website as well? Yeah, shulmanart.com. And if you're on Instagram and you want to say hello to me, you can find me there at shulmanart. I'd love to check out what you're working on. All right. And shulman is S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect. Great. Miriam, thank you so much for being with us here today on the Published Author Podcast. No, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 